Hello, I'm Kyle Kabongo, and on this edition of the LCTV News, City Council approves ARPA funds, MBTA reallocates $500 million, Westland Pop Warner cheerleading receives citation, and more. On the Lynn Lowdown, we talked mental health amendments. Here's this week's LCTV News for Friday, January 28th, 2022. This episode of the LCTV News is brought to you by Columbia Insurance Agency. Serving the Lynn community for over 60 years with home, auto, and business insurance. Tuesday City Council meeting, the council unanimously, unanimously voted 9-0 to authorize the EDIC to begin appropriating $3 million in American Rescue Plan Act to help fund its small business grant program. This will help small businesses who were impacted by COVID-19. Applicants must enforce the city's mask mandate policies within their establishment at all times, and the business has to have under 25 employees. Approximately $10,000 in grants will be distributed, distributed to a business depending on the need. The MBTA has announced that it will be reallocating up to $500 million in operation funds to support critical and timely capital invests, investments that will allow the MBTA to accelerate key capital projects in safety, advance employee recruitment, and retention initiatives, advance key investments in bus and more. The funds will be spread out as such. $67 million will will go towards accelerating key capital investments, which includes 45 million in Green Line Train Protection Project, 20 million towards recruitment and retention initiatives, which includes pay for frontline employees and the expansion of the human resources staffing program. 109 million will go towards funding for the Arbor Way bus facility design, 70 million towards advancing the new and commuter rail station project, and more. To read more about the MBTA reallocation funds, visit lintv.org and visit the news blog section. On Monday afternoon, a car crash on Hollingsworth Street sent two people to the hospital. Around 3.45, the car crashed into the home on 75 Hollingsworth Street, causing damage to the front of the home and the porch. Also damaged was the front gate of the home. The driver and his son were taken to the hospital to be treated for their injuries. The residents of the home were not injured. Witnesses say, that, witnesses say the black Honda was speeding before crashing into the home. A three-year-old is in stable condition after being hit by a vehicle last week, according to Lieutenant, Lieutenant Michael Kimmick. Around 9 p.m. last Thursday, the child was getting out of the car with his mother when he was struck by a vehicle. The child was taken to Salem Hospital with a leg injury. The child was in stable condition after being taken to a Boston hospital. The crash remains under investigation. During the city council meeting this week, the Westland Pop Warner cheerleading team were presented a citation for their victory in the Nationals down in Florida last month. Here's more from the ceremony. Najia Cunningham. Yay! <laughs> Angel Flowers. Jalen Hoyne, Hoyne? <laughs> Naya Lovell, <laughs> Feliciana Nash Sandoval, 
and Alia Volquez Rosa. Congratulations. Now this team right here um, not only uh, represented Lynn, but they were the uh, Eastern Mass champions. And then they went down to Florida and they bring home the national championship. That means, and that means they are number one in the United States, all in. So give them, hey, let's get a standing ovation, standing ovation, let's go. First, we want to give it up for head coach, Ariel Brimson. No, they can come, let them come Let them come let them come Assistant coach, Sierra Brown. Assistant coach, Amy Croce. To watch, the full, to watch the full city council meeting, visit lintv.org. Hi, my name is Jennifer Almonte. I am one of the public health nurses for the city of Lynn. And if you're watching this video, it's probably because you received one of these iHome COVID-19 self-test kits from the city. Um, today I'm gonna show you how to use, how to properly use one of these kits. All right, so once you open up your box, this is what you will find. There's two tests in each kit. So um, you're gonna find that there's two um, COVID test cards. There's these tubes that are filled with the liquid that's used for the test. And then you have two sets of swabs. You are only gonna use one for your test. Okay, so you've opened up your box. Here's what you're gonna find inside. Testing instructions, COVID test cards, the liquid inside of a tube, that's um, the testing liquid, and swabs. You're gonna find two of each one of these. There's actually two tests in each box, but you're only going to be using one for your test. All right, so next we're gonna to move to collecting the sample. So first thing you're gonna do is um, you're gonna open up your swab. It's important that when you open up your swab that you don't contaminate the swab by um, dirtying it. You're gonna take the swab out. And next you're gonna insert this swab into your nostril. You're gonna do it five times in one nostril, your right nostril, five times in your other nostril. And after you have collected that, you move on to the next step, which is actually processing your test. Okay, now we're gonna process our sample. Um, so First, it's important to note that you don't want to like take your swab that you just used and like put it on a table or something because that's a one way that you might contaminate your sample. Um, and the other thing is, is like inside of this tube that contains the liquid, there's like two ways that the cap screws on or there's two different caps. Um, what you're looking for is this bottom cap, the big orange cap. That's where you're going to use the one that you're going to use to process your actual sample. So you're gonna, um, well, before you open it, you're gonna tap it on the table, and that's just to get the liquid at, to the bottom. And then you're gonna open up the big um, orange cap, and that's where you're going to insert your swab. Once it's in there, you wanna start swirling it in there. What, you, what you're trying to do is just get whatever sample you got from your nose, you want it to get inside of that liquid because the liquid is what you're actually going to use to process your test. And even on, like, on the instructions, it'll tell you like you just kinda take the swab out a little bit and you squeeze the edges just to make sure that whatever sample you got gets inside of that liquid. That's very important. And then once you have done this, um, 15 times, you're gonna remove this, you're gonna discard of that swab, and you're gonna put your cap back on there. All right, so now we're gonna add our sample. Our sample is inside of this liquid that's within this tube. We have to get it on our COVID-19 test card. So we're gonna open up this test card and see what's inside. So 
It even says it on the test card itself that you're going to add three drops of whatever liquid's in here to the test itself. That's what we're going to do now. So we're going to unscrew this clear colored cap and we're going to add the three drops to our test. One, two, and three. And next, we're going to wait 15 minutes. Um, so next, we're going to interpret our results of our home test. Um, it's important to note that there's a little window here that has like a C and a T um, where you're going to be reading your results. The C stands for control, and the T stands for test. So if you have just one line here and no line where the T is, it means that your test is negative. Now, if you have a test that, has, that shows a line on it, that would mean that you have a positive COVID test. It means that you have to isolate and that you should um, contact your close contacts and notify them um, that they've been exposed to COVID. And now for the sports update. Lintech Lady Tigers improved to 6-4 in the season after their 54-25 victory over Notre Dame Academy yesterday. The Lady Tigers were led by Diana Heels Edwards with her 26 points. The Tigers are back on the court today when they take on fellowship. The Lady Rams have qualified for the state tournament after their 59-28 win over Medford Thursday night. Ava Thurman led the way for the Rams with her 18 points to help pace the Rams attack. Lauren Wilson and Akia Brown each added 10 points for the Lady Rams who are now 10-3 on the season. The Lady Rams visit Swampscott Monday. The Lady Bulldogs are one game away from the state tournament after a gutsy 38-37 win over Revere Thursday night. Sophomore Jay Lee Perry led the way for the Lady Bulldogs with her double-double. Perry scored 11 points and grabbed 13 rebounds. Mackenzie Acevedo added 8 points and 12 rebounds. The Lady Bulldogs are now 9-2 on the season and will travel to Somerville Tuesday. Lynn English boys basketball continue their stellar play after last night's 65-44 victory over Revere. Tyrese Melo Garcia continues to impress for the Bulldogs. The junior guard notched a double-double with his 24 points to go along with 12 rebounds and 5 assists. Big man Nelson Oba also notched a double-double with his 10 points and 18 rebounds. The Bulldogs, now 9-2 on the season, will look to clinch a state tournament bid on Tuesday when they take on Somerville. Lind Classical's boys basketball team ended a two-game skid last night as they defeated Medford 45-43. Jaden Gonzalez led the way for the Rams with 16 points. Tyler Wilson added 10 points. The Rams, now 5-6 on the season, will look to make it two in a row Tuesday when they visit Everett. St. Mary's Spartans remain undefeated in conference play after squeaking out a 52-46 victory over Bishop Feehan Tuesday night. After the Spartans built a double-digit lead in the first quarter, the Shamrocks used a second-quarter run to pull within six. The Spartans built a 39-30 lead going into the fourth, but the Shamrocks would use an 8-0 run to pull within one. The Spartans would use a late run in the fourth to give themselves a seven-point lead to secure the victory. Omri Merriman led the way for the Spartans with 20 points. The Spartans are on the road tonight as they take on Archbishop Williams. The Lady Spartans moved to 14-2 on the season after their 64-48 victory over Bishop Feehan Tuesday night. Jesse Quiles and Kayleen Prera continued their stellar play for the Lady Spartans. Quiles led the way with 21 points while Prera added 17 points. The Lady Spartans are home tonight against Archbishop Williams. Kip Academy boys basketball team dropped Dropped to 2-5 and five on the season and after falling to Whittier Tech 69-47 Tuesday evening. JTNM had a team out high 18 points and 6 rebounds and Piero Canales, Canales had added 12 points and 7 rebounds. The Panthers are back on the court tonight as they host Northeast. In a non-conference matchup Wednesday night, Lynn Tech fell to Swampscott 66-40. 
The Big Blue opened the game with a 17-point lead as they jumped on the Tigers 21-4 in the first period. The Tigers would get the lead down to 10 going into half. In the third quarter, the Big Blue would go on a 19-4 run to blow the game open. The Big, Blue, the Big Blue's lead got up to as much as 30. Lynn Tech was, late, was led by Jaden Welch with 12 points. The Tigers now 1-8 on the season are on the road Sunday when they take on Concord Carlisle. The, BS, the Boston College Eagles ended their road trip with an 0-2 record after their 58-47 loss to the North Carolina Tar Heels Wednesday night. It was a rough offensive outing for the Eagles as they shot a season low 6% from beyond the arc and 33% from the field. The Eagles also scored a season low 16 points in the second half. Big man Quinton Post led the way for the Eagles with 10 points to go along with 7 rebounds. The Eagles now 8-11 on the season and 3-6 in ACC play are back on the court Saturday when they host Pittsburgh. The Boston Bruins dropped two in a row after falling to the Colorado Avalanche 4-3 in overtime Wednesday night. After taking a 3-1 lead in the second period, after Brad Marchand's goal, the Bruins would give up two goals in the third period that would tie things up before the game went into overtime. And overtime, Kale Maker's power play goal would give the Avalanche the victory. The Bruins are back on the ice tonight when they take on the Arizona Coyotes drops at 9 p.m. The Boston Celtics have now won two in a row after their 128-75 victory over the Sacramento Kings Tuesday night at TD Garden. Jason Tatum coming off a 51-point game had another big performance as he led all scorers with 36 points to go along with six assists. Tatum was lights off from beyond the arc. 21 of his 36 points came from three as the Ford knocked down seven trays. Jalen Brown also had a big performance as he notched a double-double with his 30 points and 10 rebounds. The Seas were now 25 and 24 on the season will look to make it three in a row tonight when they take on the Atlanta Hawks. Tip-off is set for 7 p.m. On this week's Lynn Lowdown, we were joined by Senator Brendan Crichton. Here's this week's Lowdown. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Lynn Lowdown. And today we have Senator, Senator Brendan Crichton here with us. How you doing, sir? Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Mikhail. Uh, thanks you for coming back. And today we will be discussing the mental health amendments that was recently passed last last month, correct? I think I think November. November. Yeah. November. Time the, flies. The news, yeah. the news, they made the news like about it last yeah. month. Yeah, uh, that's uh, correct. Okay. Yeah. But first, Happy New Year. You know what's uh, what's it been like the first? couple weeks of, of this month it's uh continues to, <laughs> to be a strange world we're living in but mm -hmm. a happy new year to you too uh mm -hmm. just you know best uh, of wishes to, to everyone watching today and, and obviously want everyone to stay health especially during this latest uh surge so yeah uh but thanks for being here and, and hi to everyone at home all right i mean so let's let's get into this one uh what uh, what got brought what got to together to put this together so it's it's something the senate has worked on for for a long time and in last session we passed what we call the, the mental health abc ABC Act, this is now being phrased ABC 2.0 Act, which built off a lot of what we had passed last year that never quite made it to the governor's desk to get signed into law. So I think there's a, a general recognition across the country and certainly across the state now of what a, you know, a very large uh, and difficult mental and behavioral health crisis that, that we're facing. And this is prior to COVID. You know, we had started to shift focus from physical health to mental health and I think only exacerbated by the pandemic as many yeah. issues across society have, have been. Yeah, the mental health, yeah, mental health aspect has really it's taken a toll on a lot of people the past the past two, three years. No, it, it, it really has and I don't even think we, we can, you know, accurately quantify exactly how, how bad it is given that we're still in the midst of a pandemic. So, you know, I'll, I'll throw out 
our history, I think, you know, as a country or society in general across the world, you know, the focus is always on you know, the physical ailments that you have when you're thinking of medical care. Uh, what this act really tries to do is put the two on equal footing, mental health and physical health. Mm -hmm. um, so I, just to go, go through a couple of provisions, yeah. if that's yeah. cool. So I think you know, one of the big things that uh, we require through this bill is that everyone has an annual wellness exam. So I think most folks through their, you know, um, their insurance, they know that they can, they can get their annual physical. Um, and you know, certainly that's an important part as well, but you know, for many folks, it's just as important to have a mental health wellness check with, with a doctor. So this would you know, mandate the coverage for that so that every year uh, you, can get check, you can check in with the doctor, you make sure you have, you know, you're properly being examined, you're asking yourself the right questions, you're, yeah. you, you have a, a roadmap onto how to get treatment, and you can just talk to someone, which, mm -hmm. you know, right now, it's, you know, some may feel comfortable bringing it up to their uh, primary care physician during a physical, many won't. This will make it, you know, normalize it a bit more so mm -hmm. that everyone can use it. And when you think, you know, of, of younger folks that are physical, that, you know, the, you know, physically fit or don't have many, many um, physical issues at the moment, and generally very healthy. You know, the, on the mental health end, it's probably more, more just as I mean, it is just as important, but probably more important than getting your physical uh, yeah. uh, annually. So, uh, that's one big provision. Uh, another one really focuses on the parity, making sure that we're paying um, and we're treating uh, mental health care equally to physical health care when it mm -hmm. comes to. Uh, insurance providers and you know when people are actually you know having these services to making sure that they're paid out in the most appropriate way and I think we, we have laws at the federal level and at the state level already mm -hmm. that require this but there's not a ton of teeth in the enforcement piece mm -hmm. so this would give the division of uh, insurance uh, a little bit more teeth in terms of making sure that they can properly investigate making sure that they can hold folks accountable when they are not treating uh, physical health mm -hmm. treatment the same as they would uh, for uh, mental health. So, so one other piece is, uh, and this is not a fallen concept, and I'm sure many folks uh, have experienced this themselves. Right, right now, our you know emergency departments are are already crowded with with yeah. COVID cases, but you know even even prior to that, we had something called the uh, emergency room boarding crisis, where if a individual goes, oftentimes the best way to get mental health services is you know, unfortunately, is going to an emergency room. If there's a, an acute crisis on hand where someone's suffering uh, from mental health issue, often the pathway to get someone to bed is to go through the emergency room. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding now is because of limited resources, both because of the workforce, you know, workforce problems across all yeah. sectors, but yeah. uh, in particular the health sector, also, you know, lack of beds and um, often lack of uh, behavioral health specialists in emergency rooms. So we're saying, you know, uh, a patient shouldn't have to wait days or even months in an emergency room just waiting to, to, to be placed yeah. somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the worst possible environment for them. It's inhumane. It's immoral mm -hmm. to just keep someone there. It's no fault of, you know, yeah, any so individual much, person. So much going on. So much going too. on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really challenging. So this would go a long way to make sure that, uh, one thing, it would put some money. We put some money towards having a, a system where hospitals can easily access real-time information as to what beds are available. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of on the technology and making sure that, you know, at a time where, you know, hours are important. You know, you have someone there that's willing to, to seek treatment, but they can't quite find where the beds are. Let's make sure that everyone has access to the information so the hospitals can quickly identify the best place for someone to recover and get the treatment that they need. Mm -hmm. um, it also would require that every hospital, uh, you know, regardless of the time of day, has a behavioral health specialist on hand so that, you know, oftentimes when you're in the emergency room, that's the person that would be sitting down and talking to these folks. Yeah. If, if the resources are limited and that, folk, that person can't be there, it just le leads to more time for the patient to have no treatment. Uh, and also, oftentimes, when folks are actually ending up in the emergency room, it's not your typical like nine to five situation. Like yeah. this could happen at you know two o'clock in the morning. Like yeah. you, you never know. And if if an individual gets there and, and doesn't have that access to care, you know nothing's preventing them from you know walking. You know, many instances just walking out and never getting connected to that treatment. Yeah. Or to sit there and suffer and wait for for extended periods of time. Yeah, that's yeah. That's I tend to ramble, Mukal, as you know. So I'm going to pause all, now. To, it's, it's, all, it's all good. That's great information. Uh, what are what are some other provisions in, in there that are 
that are key to I it. I should should say too. This is this bill is like the combination of like a dozen or so bills. So it's it's kind of hard to to keep track of every specific detail. But um, you know, I will say you know money is important, mm -hmm. and in this recent opera, the federal money that was passed uh, as part of the opera package, and you know back in you know June or so. We had recently put that money to use uh, through our own opera bill, and we had called for $400 million. So that's a good chunk of money. When you look, it was $4 billion uh, total was our package that we passed in November. Mm -hmm. We put $400 million towards mental health. And 122 of that, $122 million of that, would go towards uh, training and retaining uh, mm -hmm. the workforce for, for mental health services. Yeah. So, you know, for, for the longest time, you know, I started working back in the state house in 2005, so like 17 years now. You know, the, these issues have come up from time to time, and for so often, so often it was, we don't have the beds we need to put people there. Yeah. That's still true, and this we do make investments on expanding, at, you know, treatment beds and inpatient facilities. But right now, during COVID, what we're seeing is there are beds. There's just not the workforce there to make those beds yeah. useful, and. Um, you know, it's still, uh, I think, a mystery to, to many why, uh, you know, where are, are the workers, and this has certainly disrupted our overall workforce. Mm -hmm. But I think identifying that need in, in infusing $122 million will go a long way to hopefully attract folks to that profession and keep them there uh, for what is a crucial time where they're so needed. And recently there were plenty of people in that, in that field that were let go that because, you know, these pro certain pro the protocols and mm -hmm. all that, so they they lost a lot of they lost a lot of workers just in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. um it's it's not a problem that's going away, but I think you know recognizing it as a state now, um, you know, is certainly a big part of the problem. I should also say too that um, you know to, this is on a much smaller scale, but since you brought up my amendments earlier, yeah. uh, I will brag I guess a little bit about <laughs> we were, we were able to get two amendments passed, which you know. Uh, depending on the bill, sometimes it's hard. You have a, a lot of competing interests. Our, yeah. Ours were, you know, pretty well received generally, not controversial, but ones that I think will make an impact. You know, uh, in state government, you know, for for far too long, folks would think you pass a major piece of legislation, you, you, whether it's transportation or health care or housing, and you know, we pass that, it's going to be you know six, eight, ten years now before mm -hmm. we pass another one. Like you do one big hit and then you yeah. you go focus on other issues. But I think what we're we're starting to see a shift, and I think it's across a, a wide range of issues, but in particular with mental health, is that this is not something we can afford to look at once every few years or to take our time in you know or to, to waste time rather and continue to you know debate these issues without coming to a resolution, without feeling that sense of urgency. Uh, so we, we created a commission, um, at, or you know, commission and task force, I mean, whatever language you want to use around it, but recognizing that these issues are fluid, they're ever-changing, especially given the pandemic and other, other issues around there, that we can't take a, a snapshot in time, you know, whether it's from 2021 or even 2022, and say, here's the policy that you know, we're going to pass to react to that issue back in that time period. We need to constantly be reviewing this. So this yeah. the amendment would bring together a wide range of stakeholders to make sure that this issue is being constantly tracked, to making sure that it, you know reports are coming out to the legislature, to the administration, so that we're not flat-footed, that we're being proactive and we're preparing for, you know, potentially, you know, greater levels of uncertainty from the next pandemic. Or, yeah. or it's it's important that we don't just look at this as a one-time thing. Especially it, when the problem doesn't seem to be going away. <coughs> Excuse me, no, exactly. And um, I do see Massachusetts as having an opportunity to be a leader in this space. Uh, we have some of the, the greatest medical institutions in the world. We have some of the greatest you know, educational institutions in the world. We have a, a, just a tremendous workforce. Um, and you know, I think folks that have been looking at this issue for a long time. So. You know, we should be a leader. We should be a leader mm -hmm. both uh, nationally and I think across the world as well. Yeah, and is there anything in there that you know, kind of focuses on young adults or teenage adults? Because it seems like they've also 
especially the ones in high school and stuff, they've also taken a big, a big hit the past couple of years, you know, with the, with the virtual learning that took, t took place all the last year and stuff and still coming back from that and recovering for that. Is there something in there that helps? Yeah, them? no, that's, it's, it's a great point. And um, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're still analyzing overall the, the overall impact, but obviously it's, it's not, um, it's, it's going to be a challenge. It's mm -hmm. going to be a challenge for so many kids, so many families. Um, and this does, just to, to point to some of the investments, because I think all, all the stuff in the bill will overall, uh, you know, help, you know, regardless of age level. Mm -hmm. But there are some guarantees, some funds that are specified for uh, the youth. So there's, uh, you know, recognizing, again, the issues around workforce. Mm -hmm. There's a $3 million, and this is in the ARPA bill, not the mental health, but so this is already law. So th this money is available now. $3 million for loan payment assistance programs to recruit and retain child and adolescent psychiatrists at community and mental health centers. So, you know, recognizing, you know, we want to attract workforce for all ages for mental health, but in particular, you know, dedicating these funds specifically to attract people to work with younger mm -hmm. uh, demographics as well. And then there's also $10 million for the rapid creation of new and patient mental health acute care beds, uh, particularly those for children, adolescents, in underserved communities. So, you know, those are just two things that, you know, I'm sure there are others for, well, certainly on the, the, on the, the boarding crisis, we see that as, you know, particularly traumatizing mm -hmm. when a child is unable to get the treatment they need and is stuck in a room for days, if yeah. not months. So, um, you know, this, again, looking, moving forward, we need to keep track of this. Yeah. Um, so this directs the department, sorry, the Office of the Child Advocate, which focuses on children, obviously, to produce an annual report on children in ED boarding. Um, so I think it's it's going to be an evolving issue, as yeah. you said, uh, but one that is crucial to the well-being mm -hmm. of so many. Yeah. And what are, what are some of the other bills that you're currently working on or ha are planning to work on for this upcoming year? No, thank, thanks for asking. Yeah, there's a, a wide range of them. We, we have some deadlines coming up, so w w committees that are, are reviewing our bills right now will su submit reports on February 2nd. Mm -hmm. So we're really, we're going all out now to try to make the case. That's kind of the first step in getting your bill into to being in play. Uh, so one bill that I, I have a, a, an eye on that um, has been uh, a, f a priority of mine for quite some time, and prior was a priority for then Senator McGee, uh, uh, you know, just recently Mayor McGee. But he, he, when he was the transportation chair, and I worked for him, had had really championed uh, a bill that would allow all eligible Massachusetts residents to earn a driver's license. So I'm, you know, it's geared towards allowing undocumented immigrants the ability to earn a driver's license, recognizing that you know your ability to drive a car has nothing, should have nothing to do with your citizenship, and yeah. you know for. Forever really hasn't. There are plenty of folks right now that aren't citizens that are able to drive uh, in Massachusetts and across the country. And uh, I think 17 other states at this point have passed similar legislation. Um, it, you know, would, in my eyes, uh, increase, uh, you know, the safety on our roads, making sure that everyone passes the same criteria to earn a driver's license, that they have insurance. So in other states, you've seen, you know, far fewer hit and run accidents. You see more people that have full insurance, which is, you know, obviously beneficial for all. And then you just look at, you know, just the, just look at the, the issue of itself. Like, well, why would we prevent yeah. residents that are here in Massachusetts yeah. from getting a driver's license yeah. <laughs> to drive to, to work or yeah. to drop their kids off at school or to go get a COVID test or yeah. to get a vaccine, to, to go to the grocery store. It's just, it blows my mind and we have, uh, you know, a broken immigration system, one that clearly is not going to be solved at the federal government anytime soon. Yeah. But here we have so many families in Massachusetts that um, are, we're, we're forcing them to break the law. And, you know, you look at the last two years, how many times have we praised our frontline workers, our grocery store workers, our human services workers? And, you know, they're out there really working hard. So many of them, uh, their statuses or the status member of a family mm -hmm. is not one that would allow them to drive. So, hey, keep the economy running, keep everyone safe, but to do so, we're going to ask you to go break the law and yeah. live in fear. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's a backward way of thinking. So. I'm hoping that the, the committee, which is reviewing the bill, will uh, get it out over the next two weeks, and then that we'll finally uh, have a robust debate 
um, and send this to the governor's desk. The governor has said he would veto it. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping, given the bill has a wide range of support from the major city police chiefs to public health officials, to education officials, to insurance mm -hmm. agencies, to major insurers like Ar Arbella has come out uh, in full support of this. So, like, we have the endorsements across a wide range of folks. I'm hoping that given some of the changes we've made to the bill that we could satisfy the governor's concerns, get this passed into law, and do the right thing for so many families. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. People driving. <laughs> well, today it's, it's, it's normal. We don't have. I mean, we don't have a public transportation system in Massachusetts that can get people where they need to go. Unfortunately, yeah. and that's a whole whole yeah, other problem. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I haven't taken public transit in a while. But the last time I did, woo. Yeah, <laughs> and some parts of the state don't don't have it at all. So I mean, what are you doing in Western Mass if you like? You're going to drive. You yeah. have to drive to get to work. Yeah. Right. Um, and just on the transportation note, to the you know, we have a handful of bills out there to try to uh, push the state forward on electrification of our tr transportation sector. Mm -hmm. And if you just look at, you know, the goals we have set in a really ambitious climate change bill last session, uh, in renewable energy bill, that we're not going to meet those uh, those requirements for getting to net zero emissions by 2050 in some even sooner dates, uh, unless we go after the transportation sector. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a big part of the governor, and I'm not knocking the governor by any means, but a big part of the governor's push was, and I, th I applaud him for this, was, you know, this uh, transportation climate initiative with other states where you would ha basically, you know, there would be a tax on um, suppliers for, you know, fuel, right? And yeah. uh, many of the states, we're interested in this at first, but sadly, almost every state had backed off. I think as the rising cost of gasoline and yeah. other political concerns came up, I think COVID certainly played a role in it, but we've backed out of that. That was gonna be responsible for helping us get towards our emissions reduction goals. So that's no longer on the table. Then you look at the hydro energy that we were pursuing from Quebec, and it required a vote, uh, or a vote was taken in Maine that basically killed that plan. Mm. Uh, though they're still making efforts to fix it, but two major pieces of our approach for reducing our emissions are, are gone, wiped off the table. So in my mind, the, the proposal that we had made to electrify our commuter rail, which would result in more frequent service and um, subway type fares for yeah. a city like Lynn, um, and clean energy obviously, uh, it needs to happen now. Like we, we can't take our time and you know, continue to deliberate on this. If we're gonna meet our goals, if we're gonna save the planet, if we're gonna be a leader in renewable energy and you know, in tackling climate change, we need to electrify our fleets, starting with commuter rail and bus, and then you know, also working on individual vehicles as well. But uh, anyways, Mikhail, I told you I, <laughs> it's all, I ramble, it's man, all, but I, I it's get fired good. up. It's an important, important information that people yeah. need to know. If the, people want to get in contact with you, please let them know how they can do that. Yeah, please do. Um, so uh, my email is brendan.crichton uh, at masenate.gov. And uh, our phone number, office phone number is 617 722 one three five zero. I'm also on. You know, you can hit me up on my Facebook page or on Twitter, um, and you know, we have a, a website as well, brennancrichton.com. But um, yeah, I'd love to love to hear feedback. It's you know, there's nothing better when you open up your email box and there's emails from constituents that they are that are sharing their thoughts and their opinions. It's crucial to the work that we do. Yes, definitely, definitely. I want to thank you for coming on and giving us all that great information that people need. Make sure if you have any concerns or questions, make sure to contact his office and get into go to his website or email him. As he said, also last note, John said he wanted me to tell you that English be classical. <laughs> <laughs> to close out Manning, to close out Manning Bowl. He <laughs> Ask him what the score was this year. <laughs> Oh, man. That's good. That's good. So John Tebow, my old chief of staff, now Jared Nicholson's chief of staff, was an English bulldog, and I, as many know, was a my classical ram. Yeah, he was my teammate. Oh, really? Yeah, he was my teammate. Yeah, I'm sure you spent a lot of time on the bench. But... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you guys been watching on Lynn Low Down. Uh, Have a great know. one. <laughs>
building bridges through music is now enrolling students for their education through music after school program. The program offers a structured after school and out of school time program, integrated music into academic subjects, expressive arts, social skills building, alternative, alternative to large after school programs, and a safe and supportive environment. The program is for kids ages 5 to 14. For more information, visit www.buildingbridgesthroughmusic.org or call 781-479-8327. Lynn Public Library's Date Night Scavenger Hunt will be going on until February 14th. Those interested in participating should visit the library and ask the main desk staff for the checklist of items that is needed for couples to find and check out in order to participate. Those who, are, those who participate in the scavenger hunt will be entered into a raffle for a chance to win a gift card to use towards a night out. To find out more about the community calendar, visit lintv.org. Thank you for watching the LCTV News. Make sure to subscribe to the LCTV Facebook page as well as the LCTV YouTube channel. Also visit lintv.org to watch any show at any time on your computer, phone, or tablet. I'm Kyle Kabongo. Have a great day.